ended up humiliating the Russians unnecessarily in the wake of the Kosovo air campaign, which I thought at the time was stupid and unnecessary. And I had worked with the Russians uh, off and on, and uh, I saw only interest in good things. I did not see any hostility, uh, and I think we blew it, frankly. We, we made terrible mistakes there. Then we walked into this thing in Iraq without understanding any of it. I mean, the idea was to drag in the U.S. Army into Iraq and keep it there. I never saw any serious thought given to purpose, method, and end state. In other words, what do we really want to achieve long run? Somebody said, well, we're going to have the first liberal democracy in the Arab world, and it will be friendly to Israel. Well, uh, you might as well talk about all sorts of miracles occurring tomorrow morning that would cure every conceivable disease on the planet. That made no sense. It was a lot of nonsense. And we've continued down this path. And now here we are dealing with this troublesome business of expanding NATO, knowing full well that it would precipitate this crisis. Then we celebrate the war and decide this is our opportunity to destroy Russia. Why? Why? What's the point of destroying Russia? Look, I'm a, I was a professional soldier. I killed people in combat. I loved being a soldier. But you, you have to have a purpose in mind, something that makes sense, a rational, attainable objective. The use of military power for the, for the sake of using it is disastrous. I think it's killing us as a country. I mean, everyone complains about China. If you look at China, they come in with lots of cash and they offer to do things and expand their relations, but they're not interested in involving themselves in the internal affairs of other societies. We seem to want to involve ourselves in everyone's internal affairs. We don't seem to want to respect other people's cultures, other people's way of doing business. We're busy judging everyone else against a utterly meaningless standard because, quite frankly, things in the United States are not very good and haven't been for a very long time. One would think that Given the destruction of our country, open borders, the ruination of our e economy, I mean, everybody forgets that China did not come to the United States and invite everyone to come to China. They did not force us to export our industries, our scientific industrial base. You know, all of this was done in the 80s and the 90s and the early part of this century by people anxious to lie in their pockets. Once again, these elites. The elites have gotten us into real trouble. The question is, what are we going to do about it? And I don't know about a future election. I'm unconvinced that it would mean much. I see a lot of evidence that the left has now established itself in power, has no intention under any circumstances of ever giving it up. In power, not just the presidency, you say, in all ways, shapes, and forms. Well, of course. I mean, if you look at the alleged Republicans, with very few exceptions, there's not much difference between them and the Democrats. They're all on the same take. They're all profiting from the same disaster. The only people suffering in the United States are Americans. The Americans are the ones who don't have the protection of the police. The Americans are the ones who uh, don't enjoy the Bill of Rights and the protections under it as they once did. The Americans are the ones that don't have freedom of speech. So it's hard for me to, it's hard for me to imagine uh, an election working at this stage, especially with all this absentee ballot nonsense. I mean, the opportunities there for corruption are an ending. I mean, the French tried it, didn't work. Several, several countries in Europe have, have tried these things and threw it out. And then treating uh, the, the requirement to prove your citizenship as some sort of evil action that's designed to harm various racial groups is absurd. Makes no sense at all. So, We've got real problems, and uh, we'll see what happens over the next few months. But as things fall apart in Ukraine, that's going to be difficult to disguise and conceal. But the opportunity then exists for stupid actions by us. Which could mean World War III, nuclear missiles being deployed. Do you think about some of those downsides? I mean, I always think of that documentary, Fog of War, where McNamara talks about how close we were and I think he had had a conversation 20, 30 years later with Castro himself. And he said, would you have really deployed, you know, nuclear missiles, even knowing that the, the death and destruction? And they said, yes, I would have. And I think that was his final warning in that movie that this is this is the biggest existential threat to humankind that no one pays attention to. Well, I think you're right. Uh, and I do think people are paying attention. The Chinese announced a long time ago, no first use. Uh, I, I think Mr. Putin has made it very clear that he will not use or employ a nuclear weapon unless there is uh, 
evidence for our use of it or someone else's use of it against them, or the imminent readiness on our part to use nuclear weapons. Now, we had effectively what was a no first use doctrine. And in March of last year, President Biden announced that he was changing it and said that we now reserve the use, you know, the right to use nuclear weapons at will against someone who uses uh, chemical weapons, biological weapons, or even uh, very large and powerful conventional weapons. In other words, he's opened Pandora's box, which I think is sheer, unadulterated lunacy. Again, this is a manufactured war, a manufactured crisis, a manufactured conflict. This is not something that Russia set out to execute. If that had been the case, what you would have seen on 22 February of last year would have been a massive offensive by a million Russian troops that would have rolled right through Ukraine without regard to the loss of human life or the loss of property or anything else and ended up immediately on the Polish border. That didn't happen because it was never the intention. It's sort of interesting, the same people who insist, well, Putin wants to rebuild the Soviet Empire, are the same people saying, well, the Russians are incompetent, stupid, and unprepared to fight. So, which is it? Which position are you going to take? Now, I don't think the Russians are stupid, incompetent, but I do think they had no intention of fighting a major war, and they only maintained the military power they needed for defense. And that turned out to be inadequate. So now we really are going to see reemerge. It's already begun a powerful Russian military establishment on the European continent in, in Eurasia. Far more powerful and far more capable than the Chinese forces. We keep talking about China, but the Chinese militarily are midgets compared to the Russians. And the Chinese will admit that. That's one of the reasons the Chinese are there at an end to try and buy the technology and the capabilities the Russians produce. So we're, we've created the very thing we said we didn't want. And there's the danger. Do we have some fool who thinks, well, we can use just a, a tactical nuclear weapon? I always love that. What's a tactical nuclear weapon? Well, it's five kilotons or less. What does this suggest? Well, it suggests that, you know, we just want to use a small weapon to make a point. <laughs> this is insane. Because your opponent is going to say, well, they're using a nuclear weapon. That means we better use our arsenal quick or we risk losing it. The use of any nuclear weapon under any circumstances, it will produce Armageddon. We need to understand that. And I don't see any evidence for that on uh, Mr. Putin's agenda at all. But I hear people in Washington say stupid things about it regularly. There are still foolish, deranged people here who believe you can fight and win a nuclear war. Impossible. It's not going to happen. Yeah, I appreciate those insights. Colonel, you talk about how we vilified Russia for decades, and I grew up in that Cold War. I grew up watching that television uh, movie the day after, and I would literally would have bad dreams when I was a kid, worried about the Russians and, you know, Rocky III and all that. Are we doing the same to the Chinese? Um, because you, you talk about China in a way I don't hear anyone talking about, a very real way, being honest about their military capability, even their intentions. I was actually in Austin, Texas last week, and I, I bumped into a, a Chinese a man who was a venture capitalist, and he said, he said, Brian, I, I, I know your show, and, you know, and, and I want you to know that what, what people say about China isn't true. He's like, we want to do business where people just like you, and I just wanted to come up and talk to you, and hopefully we can start a relationship. And I, I found it really interesting, because that's not the narrative I get from all of my news. So what, what is really happening in China, in your opinion? Well, the short answer to your initial question is yes, we're demonizing China, I think quite unnecessarily. But the second part, in response to what that Chinese businessman told you, is no, the Chinese are not like us at all. If you spend time in Northeast Asia, as I have, you very quickly discover that the Chinese on Taiwan, the Chinese in China, and for that matter, to a large extent, I would argue the Japanese and Koreans, although they have their own version, all admire and want to imitate Singapore. Now, if anyone's been to Singapore, uh, Singapore is a place where I personally would be very unhappy, where I think most Americans would be unhappy. 
Uh, it's it's wonderfully clean. It's heavily policed. The government controls and owns virtually everything. Uh, and everyone scrupulously obeys the laws because everyone is there for one reason. Make money. So the, the things that we worry about, our personal freedoms, this uh, notion of uh, republicanism or democracy, as people like to call it, that's foreign to the Chinese. The Chinese are not interested in that. They want to be crime-free. They want to be able to make money, improve their living standards, to live as much as possible without interference. But they're willing to tolerate a level of government influence and power that we never would. That doesn't make them bad. It's a fact of life. And if Xi is compared with anyone, I would compare him to a Chinese emperor. And the Chinese emperor had the mission that, that Xi has, which is you've got to feed everyone. Very important for a nation of 1.4 billion. You've got to clothe everyone, protect everyone. That is, put them under shelter. And then you have to defend the country. And remember, that was China's enormous weakness over the last couple of hundred years. They couldn't defend themselves. They were overwhelmed not only by Western powers, but by the Japanese. And they had been overwhelmed previously by the Mongols. We also forget that out of the last thousand years, China has only been under Chinese government for about 350 of those years. In the intervening periods, they were ruled by foreigners. So... That's what Xi is worried about. He wakes up every morning and says, what am I going to do to prevent dynastic change? What if something goes wrong out there and people don't get enough to eat? What if they, if they can't find employment? One out of every four Chinese men between the ages of 18 and 30 is currently unemployed. That number is growing. The shadow banking structure was destroyed because it was corrupt. Xi has been trying to crush corruption everywhere, in the shipyards, in the military. People have been jailed and executed. That's the only way to get anybody's attention over there. Xi has a tough problem. He wakes up every morning worried about all of those things. And yeah, I think he worries about the United States Navy and Air Force doing damage to him. But you've got to step back and ask the question, if you were going to use military power against China, just exactly what would you do? You know, Michael Farmer, the famous industrialist and, and financier, says, well, inside China, there are at least four or five versions of the United States in terms of size and population. I mean, who are we kidding? What do, what do, you, what do you expect to achieve with military power? Nothing. Are there Chinese armies preparing to march into Southeast Asia? No. Are there Chinese armies preparing to in, invade the Korean Peninsula? No. Are there masses of Chinese building little rubber boats to float over to Taiwan? No. And anybody who knows anything about Taiwan, what a terrible place to invade. It's a hundred miles across open water. And then once you get there, most of the island is, is mountainous. There are only a couple of beaches you can land on. And why would they do that? They don't want to do that because the Chinese on Taiwan and the Chinese in Beijing generally share similar goals. They all want to live in the end state that I described. Which is why you may well see the old party, the KMT, that was created by Chiang Kai-shek win the next election. They're sweeping the local and regional elections right now because nobody really wants to go to war under any circumstances with China. They want to do business with China. And that government has said, we will unify with the mainland. We'll, we'll do it gradually. And that's what Xi wants. He said, well, maybe 2045. <laughs> You know, here we are, well, there's a, an invasion coming next week. It's all nonsense. It's, it's just untrue. And you have to ask yourself if some of this is just to justify more wasteful spending on a whole range of things in defense that are obsolete. I appreciate that insight. I want to ask you about what's happening on our borders with the cartel wars as well. You've said a few things about this, and I just wanted to get your thoughts on, on the dangers there and what you think is, is actually happening. Well, what's actually happening is you can watch it on television. There are, we've had up until this point, three or four million people come into the country illegally. We've always had a problem with it. We've always been invaded by illegals, but we just frankly opened the border and invited everyone in. We don't know who's coming. Last year, they had 20,000 Russians. They had at least that many Chinese that came over, of course, with the hundreds of thousands of people from Latin America. We had large numbers of people from Africa. Now, these people are, in most cases, coming because they want a better life. There's no question about it. 
But you have to look at the United States, and I would argue most of the Western world, as a rowboat, or, or not a rowboat, I think the, what's the right word for these uh, boats that we have on ships that we pile into in the event that the ship sinks? Mm. Uh, I can't Life, remember the correct term. Lifeboats. Lifeboats, Life boat. that's right. I'm, I'm not a naval officer, <laughs> so thank God. Anyway, the, the bottom line is that uh, we're a lifeboat, and you know you can swap the lifeboat and sink it. And we are in danger of that. People say, oh, well, you've got plenty of room. You know, but that, that's not the point. Not all of it is arable. Not all of it uh, we, do we want to despoil and destroy. And that's not where people are going anywhere. They're, they're migrating these big cities where they can get access to free services and free money and free this, free that. That's part of the problem. The larger part is also criminality. We, we don't know who's coming in, and we, we see the crime rising everywhere. And a lot of it is illegal, not all of it. We just had a terrible tragedy where one illegal killed several illegals, shooting people, men, women, and children at point-blank rage. And then we have this government that refuses to enforce the law. You know, the, these are the George Soros uh, appointees, as they're called, because they were backed with enormous money from George Soros to put people in power who, would, frankly, want to weaponize criminality in the government against people like me and you. Uh, we're now the enemy in our own country. Uh, so it's uh, it's disastrous. And I, I wonder how much longer this can continue before something breaks in a big way. The, the population is angry. And uh, we're not French. We don't immediately go into the streets and destroy the things and uh, I wish in some cases we were. We're somewhere between the French and the Germans. Uh, we're law-abiding by nature. We want to make the system work. But increasingly, it's becoming obvious that the system doesn't work. It's broken. And, you know, you've got a government that was designed in the 1780s for a very different population, a much smaller country. We shouldn't be surprised that it's not working. But uh, we're being overwhelmed for for all these reasons with the collusion of our own government and media in ways that are leading to our destruction. Will, uh, will Trump win next year? And if he wins, could he change the course of some of this? And lastly, would you ever work for him again? First of all, I, I'm sure he wants to run. That's, that's not the issue. Will he be able to? Uh, I think there is enormous uh, effort invested in convicting him as a felon. If you're a convicted felon, you cannot run for office. And I think that's where the left is working. Remember, the Justice Department is weaponized against us, and it's being used against him. Uh, they're very particular about whom they prosecute. And he's at the top of their list for things that I think in most cases would be ignored or the cost of doing business. But that's another story. Again, I'm wondering if we get to that election before things really begin to fall apart. And what do you do if you discover that out of your electorate of, say, 150, 160 million, that more than half of that elector electorate doesn't think the system works? You know, everything is a function of confidence. People say, well, when do you think the financial system will collapse? Well, when people lose confidence. What happens with banks when people lose confidence? You get bank runs. Uh, what happens when people around the world are lose confidence in our economic strength and the, the viability of our financial system? Well, they dump treasuries. What happens when you get fire sales on U.S. treasuries? Armageddon. So th these are things that no one can predict, and I can't predict when Americans finally say enough is enough and we won't go any further with this. But uh, I, I just don't know if we'll get that far. If we do... Uh, again, the problems, I, I grew up in a city, North Philadelphia, where there hasn't been a free, fair election in 50, 60 years. And I won't go over the history. That's a problem in all the large cities. So you just write them off. The only way that you could run a free and fair election would be to declare martial law. And then uh, you'd have to confirm the validity of people's identity and their citizenship. You might get a different outcome. I think you probably would, but that's not going to happen. So what what happens? Everywhere, everyone that lives everywhere else, it's a different world. So you have two worlds. You know, it's almost rural versus urban in some ways, reminiscent of what I saw in Bosnia Herzegovina, but it's worse. 
uh, because the, the urban areas